So I appreciate everybody showing up today. It is Earth Day. I'm wearing my green because of that. Um, I'm excited, really excited to be joined by our panel of Amy, Ina, and Lee, and we'll get into them in a minute. Um, many of you know me, but not all, but uh, my name's Brian Formato. I run two companies, Groove Management, which is a human capital consulting firm, and LeaderSurf, which is my passion play, which is an experiential leadership development program that's been on hiatus for over a year, but uh, takes leaders from around the world to Costa Rica or Nicaragua and teaches them to surf mm -hmm. and to embrace failure as learning and to be better leaders. Um, in terms of group management, it's a human capital consulting firm. We help individuals and teams maximize their performance by focusing on the things they already do well, their group, their strengths. And we've prided ourselves as a company on anticipating trends and changes to the world of work. So you know, a year ago, we were on the local news and talking to people about how to make work from home work for your company and what do you need to do to, um, to make that giant pivot. Um, and now on the back end, hopefully, of the pandemic, I thought this was a really timely uh, topic to bring together a panel of experts from diverse set of industries to talk about what is the world of work going to look like post-pandemic knowing that we can't really go back, we're gonna go forward and what does the future look like? Um, so what I'd like to do before we actually even dive in to the, um, the discussion is I actually wanna put a question to all of you, the audience. And so um, the question is this, where are you attending this Zoom meeting from today? Are you home? Are you in the office? Or are you in a work from anywhere location? I'll give it a minute and then I will share kind of what we got back. All right, so it looks like we've gotten pretty good list. So it looks like we've got 75% of you are at home, 20% of you are in the office and 5% of you meaning one person is in a work from anywhere location. Um, hopefully that person's somewhere that would make us all jealous and that we'd wanna be. So with that said, I'm gonna close the poll. Let me go back to um, this and say, so with that, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna ask each of the um, panelists to share a little bit about who they are, the company they work for, where that company operates, the business that they're in, and something that they've learned about their company through COVID. So with that, um, Amy, I'm gonna start with you and have you say a few words about yourself and about Databricks. Great, thanks so much, Brian. I'm really uh, happy to be here today with all of you. And my name's Amy Reichenator. I'm the Chief People Officer at Databricks. And Databricks is a company that plays in the AI big data space. We are one of the fastest growing technology companies in the US right now. We are growing about 100% year over year and was recently valued at 28 billion as a private company. Um, we have about 2000 employees globally in 18 countries. And um, one of the things that I've learned about uh, my company during this time is just the capacity to change. And that we, because we are a highly technical uh, environment that we work in and a very engineering centric culture, there was always a lot of sort of leading with the head when it came to decisions. And in the context of last year, which was one of the hardest year of many people's lives and also continuing to grow a business at 100% year over year, it really required the leadership team and all of our employees to be different. And I think what they learned and what I learned, uh, you know, in trying to help the company through this experience was just the power of leading with empathy and that you could continue to straddle, you know, giving employees a, a great experience during a really difficult time and also, you know, sort of crush it as a business. That's awesome. Amy, I'm going to ask one other question though. You said with 100% growth, so how many people have you hired in the past year that have never met another Databricks employee? Oh, probably five or 600. Wow. Okay. So that, that's an interesting kind of data point in terms of, you know, COVID and onboarding people without actually sure. meeting them. So we've learned a lot about how people connect this way. Right. Perfect. Well, thanks for being here. Lee, we'll turn to you. Tell us a little bit about you and the Motley Fool. Great. Thanks for having me, Brian. Um, before I kick in, I'll just throw a plug for, uh, for Brian. We're 
avid and loyal leader surf customers. We send a lot of people. So anyone ever wants to talk to me about the value of sending people to leader surf, um, I'm here for you, Brian. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so um, I head up the people team at the Motley Fool. We are a um, financial education and services company out of Alexandria, Virginia, um, up to about 600 employees. Uh, like Amy, we've we've grown a lot in the last couple of years, and uh, especially during the pandemic, it's an interesting time to be at a company that's finding great success. Uh, you know, in a world where certainly a lot of people are struggling and some businesses are struggling, so there's some some um, some balance points there. Um, we have we provide a number of different services, everything from personal investing advice to uh, to managing money. We have uh, our two largest. Um, offices, um, uh, which we can talk about how that's changed, are in Alexandria and Denver, Colorado, um, but we also have offices uh, in other parts of the world, uh, Australia, Germany, Canada, UK, et cetera. Um, something that, that's been interesting for us is we have, we, we typically get a decent amount of um, PR and press for having a really strong and great culture. And uh, I've been here 23 years, so it's it's one that has uh, really been built while we were an office-based company. And I think if you asked me and any of our employees, you know, 18 months ago, what would happen if we all went virtual to our culture? I think people would have said we might struggle. And what we found was the opposite was true. And turns out the things that that really make our culture strong, things like caring for one another, loving one another, trust, autonomy, these are things that can happen anywhere. You don't need the physical office uh, to exhibit those things in the culture. So yeah, we really saw, I think maybe used the word resiliency. Um, uh, it works. Our, our culture can work anywhere. That's awesome, Lee. We'll, we'll kind of double click on that a little bit more in a few minutes. So thanks for that. And Ina. Hi, good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm Ina Strand. I'm based in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. But if you wonder where my accent mm -hmm. is from, I'm Norwegian. Um, I represent Alimentation Kushtar. And if you're not from Canada, that may not ring a bell, but that's actually the largest convenience store operator in Canada and also a large global company with Canada as a base. But outside of Canada, we're more known under the banner of Circle K. We operate in 26 countries. We have 14,000 stores and some, and then we have 135,000 employees at work every day. And our situation was a little bit different during COVID. We were deemed essential business because of the fuel supply and also the grocery and, and food that we serve to our local communities. So uh, our first, I think, entering into the pandemic was like, oh, how are we gonna stay open <laughs> with, uh, with the pandemic uh, and entering us so, so rapidly. So, so that was kind of different, uh, having to keep all of our stores open, but at the same time, having like everyone else have talked about here, having to move to a virtual environment with lockdowns and, and restrictions in all of our markets. So we've been managing the balance of those two things. Personally for me, I had just taken over the responsibility for HSE and sustainability, including emergency response and communications um, just before the crisis hit. So it's, it's been a learning journey for sure on, on so many different aspects. I, I think if I would say one thing that we've learned as an organization, or I will actually say to Brian, if I may, yeah. I think for the, <laughs> for the office population, I think we learned that the, the impossible is possible. Uh, because if, if we asked ourselves questions before this, can we close the books from a virtual environment? Can we, all these things, we would have said, no, that's impossible. Can we run a call center from remote? No. Uh, we've proven that we could, and it changed the way we're thinking about so many things. Uh, for our store population, the majority of our population, uh, one thing that kind of has resonated with me during the pandemic is the power of purpose. Uh, for our people to go from being, you know, just a regular convenience store clerk uh, to be called frontline heroes uh, and being thanked by their local communities for, for being open, being a place where you could go and get those essentials need covered. That was such a impactful, big shift for, 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 for them and for us as an organization. And we really kind of worked with that 
uh, and, and with that comes all the pride, uh, the communications efforts internally and externally that kind of build on that momentum. So that, that has been a, a huge shift for us as an organization. Excellent. Wow. So what I love so far is just the idea that, you know, all three companies, there's real learnings. Um, sometimes, you know, we're resistant to change, but when we're forced to change, all of a sudden, like there's a lot of lessons and it's usually for the better. Um, and so you know, this idea of companies being resistant to video and to letting people work remotely to all of a sudden, you know, we've proven that um, this experiment works. I always refer to what's going on as this is a fascinating movie to watch in terms of the impact COVID has had. The only thing is we don't know how it ends and we're all starring in it. So um, with that, let me jump to kind of the first question that I'd like to pose to the group um, is this data point from the Best Practices Institute. Well, 83% of CEOs want employees to return in person. Only 10% of employees want to come back to work full time. Right? And 47% say that they're likely to leave the job if they're not allowed to work remotely at least part of the time. So with that said, um, Amy, I'm gonna turn to you first. What, what are you guys thinking in terms of, you know, is your CEO in that 83% or your employees in the 10%? Are you guys somewhere in the middle? What, what are you, what's Databricks thinking? Yeah, it, it's a great question. We, I mean, we've been very data-driven through this because I think while most companies had a similar experience, which is that they found out pretty quickly that you could go home and um, people would work just as hard, if not harder than they were before. Uh, we've been collecting data along the way. And what we've seen is that people actually have reported and their managers have reported super high levels of productivity and actually high levels of happiness. The big change that we've seen over time is just in the sense of how connected people feel and that this experience has worn on people over the course of the year. And so we are going to go back in some sort of hybrid fashion, um, you know, in the tech space, in the Bay Area, we're seeing kind of two trends in terms of hybrid. One is people are required to be near the office to come in two days a week. And then there's sort of the Facebook model, which is it's hybrid, but you can kind of work wherever and come in when you'd like. And we're probably more uh, in the first camp, which is that we do want people to come back in the office because we have data that indicates that people are feeling less and less connected over time. And we're trying to think through what does that mean in terms of being intentional around uh, culture as we shift into a hybrid model? And also how do you not lose productivity? Because people have filled in the gap where they used to yeah. commute with work time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we've all been locked at home. So there hasn't been much else to do except for work. And when the world opens up again, which it is, I think people are gonna really feel the need to reconnect with their friends, their family, go out and do things. And, and also adding back in commute time. So we're trying to be intentional about uh, how we implement technology to help with having people in and out of the office. And then also how we help managers lead through this change because we need to be intentional about uh, expectations that are set and how we are continuing to be supportive of employees through this next transition. And what we see is that employees have a lot of anxiety about the change again. And as we started to talk about what returning to work could look like later this year, we're seeing all kinds of reactions from people. And most of it is anxiety about mm -hmm. another big shift. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes in terms of the anxiety and mental health. You know, what about for Circle K? I mean, is there, you know, do you guys have a clear game plan or still figuring well, out? No, we're still kind of rethinking our approach a little bit because I think one of the differences with us is that we were a store centric organization. So while many others are talking about how to get back to the offices, our conversation is really about how do we get out to the stores again? Because we had a culture where we, we, it was a requirement for all people to visit stores so often. The leadership will be more than we spend time in meetings. We spend time visiting stores and we do our meetings while we're traveling together in cars, while we're there at the store, really like seeing how are my HR initiatives implemented at the store level. And that's where we take the conversation. Uh, so for us, the pandemic has been difficult in, in that aspect and that we cannot visit the store. So, so that's kind of our first priority right now. How can we get back to that culture of being out there in the business where everything happens? Uh, and then on the on the office side, so we are talking about that too. What we've seen similar to Amy, uh, our first surveys that we did in the pandemic, all people wanted to stay at home. 
then as time has, you know, it, it has evolved, we feel the loneliness, we feel other things now, it, it shifted. So now a third of our people are saying that they want to come back to the offices strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have this other chooser that wants some flexibility and, and they're all over the place. Someone wants to stay 100% at home, but the majority of that population says one to two days of flexibility is what they really want. So we've said to our organization that we will give it through September. That's when we're estimating that all of our markets are more or less through the pandemic, hopefully, mm -hmm. fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we will talk about it then and doing new, new surveys and have new conversations with our people where people really stand because we see that their preferences vary with, with the duration of the pandemic and the, the, the different levels of anxiety they feel for different things during the pandemic. We do see early signs here in the U.S. where a lot of people are vaccinated, that there is a desire to come back to the office. And, and for us, being together and being in the office has been an important part of the culture. So, so we have to find the right balance. Uh, we also see a hybrid model going forward. I don't think we will go back to where we were. And there are some, some productivity gains that Amy referred to. There are also some travel, like the, the people hated their, their, their travel. So some of those meetings where we where we can be as effective virtually, some trainings that we can be as effective virtually, we will probably never go back to those practices. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I think there is definitely going to be a big impact on corporate travel, just in terms of the efficiency flying across the country for a two-hour meeting when you can have it like this just as effectively. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Lee, what, what about you guys in terms of you know, this delta between what some companies and employees, and not all companies are on that 83% scale, but. Yeah, and our, our timeline is similar. We're looking at um, September before we are reopening our offices in, in any way, shape or form. Um, we're being slightly more intentional in not encouraging people to come back to the office full time. Um, we're, we're talking about virtual first. We were trying to solve a challenge before the pandemic, which was, um, in, at least within our culture, a disadvantage to being at home when other people were in the office. So we, we saw um, career advancement, um, getting projects, uh, this sort of thing. You were at a disadvantage when you were sort of calling in from home. We've probably all been in that situation where there's a whole group of people having side conversations in the office and you were missing out. And so what we've, we were trying to solve that problem and trying to figure out how could, how could we get there? The pandemic has helped us sort of fast forward to show everybody, to show managers and so forth that, um, you know, as Amy said, the product productivity is not an issue. So our return to work is going to be more um, offices will be an intentional thing like a, a, an intentional collaboration or training or that sort of thing. But we're encouraging people to, um, you know, work more from somewhere else. We've opened up additional states where we used to be sort of limited where you can work. Now we're telling people you can work from anywhere. Um, and then to answer your question directly, our CEO is in the 17%. And so <laughs> what he has said is, I want to make sure that no one feels they ever have to come into an office again. It doesn't mean we won't have some offices available and that you couldn't come in if you choose to, but we want to make sure if you prefer not to come into an office, you never have to. And then the sub bullet to that is, um, and you know, it won't affect your career in any way. And he sort of challenged us to say, in fact, could you be more successful? So we're really trying to solve that challenge of, um, can I work from a, a remote location and be uh, just as successful with my career as if I was coming into the office every day? Yeah, that's, that's great, great point. So let me shift a little bit. Yeah, one of the things that was brought up was this idea about mental health. So people and HR leaders need to start 2021 with mental health top of mind and start thinking about how to best support employees and their varying anxiety levels about COVID and back to work measures. Um, that's a quote from Amy that she wrote in an op-ed piece for CNBC. Um, curious, you know, from the three of you, and I'll, I'll let either any, any of the three of you kind of speak to this, you know, what, if anything, are you doing to um, ensure that you, you know, reduce the anxiety level with your employees and that you keep some connectedness? Because one of the things that we found in Natalia, who's on here um, today, she and I had been running this workshop um, really around you know, resilience and how to deal with um, the isolation feeling that people have working from home and interacting only through the computer. And so I'm curious, 
you know, um, from Lee, you know, or Amy, what are you guys finding in terms of how do you help employees cope with the anxiety level um, currently? Um, Lee, I can start since I was the yeah, one who you wrote it. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the biggest thing that we're trying to do is uh, just empower people with information. And one of the things that we've done is that we have uh, actually separated when we're giving people timing updates on when we would be returning and guaranteeing we would give them at least a couple of months notice before they would be required to, to return. Because I think people, especially with children at home are trying to figure out how to manage through this. Uh, so I think just sort of knowledge is power. We've also been like incredibly transparent about what the data is that we're collecting and what people are experiencing so that they don't, it kind of normalizes how people feel about this transition again. Um, and then I think the other thing is just trying to empower the leaders with skills to be able to help their employees have a place to talk about it. Because mm -hmm. even when I talk to my own team who needs to help lead the company through this next phase of transition, I see their anxiety about it and people need time to acclimate to the change in order to feel comfortable with that. And so we're just trying to talk about it early and often to give people time to adjust. Uh, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. Ina or Lee, anything from your perspective on kind of the anxiety and concerns people are having? Yeah, similar. I think the mental health issues uh, through the duration of this pandemic has been very real and they've been at every level of the organization and in so many facets. I think here in the US also, with the social injustice and everything else going on, it, it's been a it's it's been a very special year. We have made sure that all of our assistance program have been more front and center, so people know where they can go and where they can turn to if if they need that support. But but also to Amy's point, it's really about the conversations at the team level. So we initiated a, a, a huge task for everyone this fall. And uh, when I think fall was when people really started to feel it. And uh, so we had something we called COVID fatigue plans that included mental health. So we had all of our local teams have a specific conversation about how they felt, what they could do together as a team. And there was a lot they could do at the team level and then any other initiatives surfaced up uh, through those teams. So we had a plan that we built out at the global level too with certain initiatives that we could do to support support our teams but it, it's been really all over the place it's been from virtual coffees to creating teams rooms where people can come and have a lunch together if you miss a social interaction it's been supporting with child care for those who are just exhausted by trying to manage this life of looking after your kids while you're trying to attend zoom meetings and never being able to sleep it, it's been i think it's been so different for individuals so the individualization and the the local uh, different uh, tactics and also the leaders roles in this and then looking particularly after our leaders because they are also in the same situation themselves while they need to look after all those teams and so, so that's been our approach yeah great yeah it's yeah I would, say, I would say all of the above for us um you know we're we're dealing with a little smaller scale with only 600 employees so it's it's a little easier for us to do the individual approach one thing we did was um, we made our surveys uh, non-anonymous, and that, that's not normal in our culture. Normally, we're doing a lot of um, anonymous surveying and, and looking at data. And this was intentional to really try to look at not only the data, but the individual and what they were going through, and then using our team to go back and follow up on uh, a lot of the things that we were seeing in the surveys for what people's individual needs might be. And then we were sort of able to look at trends from that and step back and do some, some wider um, company initiatives. Uh, I think it's also helped us look at the services that we do offer. Uh, one of our best tools has been uh, a partnership with uh, Talkspace. That's the, like Michael Phelps and okay. is it Colby Calais, whoever there's, you know, it's on there on TV all the time. They've been incredible. It's been a really good resource um, and external resources for people. Can you say a little bit, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Say a little bit more about what it is. Talkspace, it's, it's essentially you can get, I don't know, at least what we find is that um, getting mental health professionals through your normal healthcare providers is a difficult thing, at least in the United States. There's, uh, um, uh, there's just not enough of them to go around. And so it's a hard thing to find. This is how you can call, you can get um, help within 24 hours um, for anything that you're going through. Um, it's not an expensive benefit to add on. And it's one that we just had sitting there that I think wasn't getting as much use. And so 
finding the ones that are working, pumping them up, um, get them out to people. It's, yeah, it's been helpful. That's great. Yeah, that's a resource there. So I, I was reading an Inc. Magazine article and um, Roland Bush, the CEO of Siemens said, we trust our employees and empower them to shape their work themselves so they can achieve better possible, you know, the best possible results. With the new way of working, we're motivating our employees while improving the company's performance capabilities and sharpening their profile as a flexible and attractive employer. And so the, as a CEO, they're looking at Let's focus on outcomes rather than time spent in the office. It's not about FaceTime. It's not about being in front of people and trusting and empowering employees. And he goes on to say that if you can't trust your employees, then you probably have the wrong employees. And so I thought this was really interesting in terms of a CEO really sedating that you know, they're shifting their culture to embrace kind of this new world of work. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, Ina, how does, how does this align with kind of the thinking of, you know, as I said, you're not going back to the future. You're kind of going, or you are going back, but not to the way things were, but to a new future. Um, how's Circle K, Kushtar, rethinking um, expectations on employees? Yeah, and again, I mean, for the majority of our population who works in the stores, we don't have this type of, uh, of flexibility. But I, th I think we're, we're just trying to build on some strengths that we already have. I mean, Brian, you and I have talked about that, that we're one of the few larger companies that you know that pride ourselves in not having an HQ. <laughs> and so our resources are spread all around. Uh, we're often co-located with some of our other local business units where they operate. But we also always have allowed remote work. And so we have one individual in one state where we don't operate who works from that person's home office. So, so we got, try to differentiate between the remote work, people who are not even co-located with anyone in the company and the, the work from home where, where this is more about being close to an office and having the opportunity to go in but choosing not to. And, and I, I think that's kind of really where we we see the for, for that little population that are close in office but that want to kind of now shape their yeah. their personal uh, you know agenda to, to for whatever is right for them that's really the population that we're focusing on so for, for us I think it, it's more about you know keeping the cadence of the business keeping as I said like focusing on on visiting the stores more often and continuing to allow that flexibility we've had because we've operated that way with a lot of travel and a lot of yes. business. So you said something that I think, yeah, I, I still find this really unique. You're a company with 130,000 employees and you don't have a headquarters. Why don't you have a headquarters and how do you think that helped you to adjust during the, the pandemic? <laughs> Same thing that we didn't want to build. Like our founder said, we don't want to build ivy towers. He didn't want people in in the support function to be too too distant. So by not having an HQ, but having teams that are spread out, sitting with different VPs and their teams of operations, that we would be closer to the business. And and honestly, leading a global function myself, just having people so spread out is hard. <laughs> and, you know, we have to travel to get together. But the, the, the eyes and ears that we have to be able to support the business better by having people so spread out is really amazing. So, so we're kind of a little bit more in the, are we losing out of an, an advantage and a competitive edge that we've had? Because by being so, so flexible and, and having people so spread out, we've been a little bit unique because some people work for us because they want to live on this farm in Ohio that's one of my team members like he that's where he wants to live and we've allowed him to live there far away from another office and he's still the VP of HR in North America uh, so by everyone else kind of now adapting to this new ways of working are we kind of losing out a little bit on, on the competitive edge that we've had for a while that's that's our that's interesting mm -hmm. yeah cool Amy what about for you and for Databricks in terms of kind of this trust and empower no, I think we've always worked in a high trust environment. So that uh, was a, an easy transition for us with everyone going home. And because we're in such high growth mode that the uh, work is outcome-based anyway, that the need to deliver at this pace is just extraordinary. Uh, what I think is really interesting about the Siemens quote is that it does bring to light that, you know, culture has always been a competitive advantage for companies. And I think that competition around that is gonna get more intense. 
because this is going to impact companies in all different ways. Some companies are going to do it well, other companies will struggle, and it will end up being something that I think companies can either use to their advantage or they're going to you know, lose out in the market to employees who want uh, to see companies manage this type of change well. And so I think it's really important to be very intentional about how you develop culture through this next phase of transition, whatever it means for different companies, yeah. but just to make sure, because the employees will always have, you know, the market actually fortunately is still pretty good. And um, so it will certainly, you know, be important how we work through this and, you know, employees will continue to have lots of choices of where to go. Valid. Lee, what about yeah, the Fool, which is very much a values-driven mm-hmm. company, your core values. Yeah, you've won awards for your handbook and values and the way that the Motley Fool treats its employees. Yeah, I mean, like Amy, we've, we've always been a very uh, trusting and lots of autonomy company. Um, you know, we've been, been that way for 30 years. Um, it, it's really that what I think what, there's the difference between kind of the command and control and then support and empower. And so I think where we are today is how you support and empower people who are um, working from anywhere in the world. And personally, I love that shift that, uh, you know, you, even just what, two years ago, a lot of the discussion was about productivity. Are people working from home really as productive in the office? Like that was like every article that you read. And I think to now today's articles are, how do we do a better job supporting the people that are working from anywhere in the world? And um, I just love that tone and direction so much more. We believe that um, it's gonna be a, a pretty big role shift for team leads, how they communicate, um, uh, be, having to be a lot more intentional um, and, and everything from goals to um, corporate communications, direction, that sort of thing. So um, I think there's going to be a shift for, for team leaders, at least in our company, for how they manage their day-to-day. Should this be a meeting? Should this be a Slack conversation instead? Uh, am I overwhelming my team? Am I communicating clearly? Like um, th- These will be some of the big challenges, I think, in the couple of years ahead. Yeah. Well, so Lee, I'm going to f- ask you to lead on this question. So this came in from Lori Tennant from Norwest Venture Partners. Um, yeah, she had, a, um, when registering, had put this question to the group, which was, how can we effectively engage in meetings when some participants are remote and some are in person? So this hybrid meeting, and as you start bringing people back, you may have some that are in the office and some that aren't. Um, does the Motley Fool, or have you come up with any game plan that makes this work better than you know, other approaches? Well, as I was saying, this is our number one question. Um, we want to we want to level the playing field, and so we're taking the approach that you need to be a tile. And so, even if you're in the office, um, we are we are not going to have people gathered in a room while some people are on, are um, calling in. Uh, everyone's going to have their laptop. Uh, we're redesigning our office space to um, enable that type of communication where people can. Um, duck into corners and that sort of thing to still uh, do their meetings. And I think our offices are going to be designed more around um, collaboration spaces where there's an intention that you need to come in. Um, if, if we need to collaborate, we'll fly everybody in that we need to. So you're either in person or not, but our default is going to be to our uh, virtual employees. And we think that that will be the key to leveling that pay, playing field. But Honestly, I'm in a meeting about this probably every single day as we try to, uh, yeah, solve this challenge. So I, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't think it, we have all the answers. It's going to be an, an interesting ride. Like you, I'm, I'm excited to watch this movie and um, what a great time to be uh, working in the world of people. Um, these are fun challenges to try to figure out. Yeah. Amy, what about you guys? Are you do you have a, an approach to how you deal with people in the office versus not, or you know, using um, Zoom or Teams, or um, you guys use Google Meet? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Lee. First of all, I think it's just like such an amazing time to be in this type of role because there's so many interesting new uh, problems to solve that we haven't had the opportunity to think about before. And I think this is probably gonna be one of the keys to doing this hybrid work model effectively. Uh, you know, I, I'll admit we don't have the answer yet on this one. We're also thinking about exactly what Lee was saying, like do you keep everybody on video 
uh, individually when you're in the office so everyone's a tile or are there other technologies and companies that have thought this problem through that can help us where the technology is more advanced than what it used to be, which is that people that were on video often felt like they couldn't hear, or there was rustling, or when people laughed, the sound got drowned out, all the things that made it challenging when you were the people that were remote versus uh, in the room. And so we're still working on this. It's definitely a big question for us. But our, in terms of our office space, we're also renovating our office space to be more collaboration focused. I mean, what we've definitely learned is that people don't need to sit at a desk in an office with a pair of headphones on trying to find a quiet space when we know that they can do that work effectively from home. So when people do come in the office, we want it to be intentional to be together, to have the opportunity to socially interact and brainstorm and do the things that are most important to do in person. Yeah. And Hina, anything in terms of you know, using technology or you guys have people in other countries as well. I mean, I think all three companies do, but, um, you know, with your workforce, you know, I think it's what, nine countries throughout Europe. Yes, that's right. And now Hong Kong as well. So now we have time zones that are 13, 15 hours apart. So, so that's a complication with the virtual meetings for sure. The ma managing through the time zone. So I, now I, you know, I totally agree with Lee and Amy here. This is the really hard one to solve. So we had a test, <laughs> last week because we brought 12 of our executives in the US together for a business planning session, all are vaccinated and we're all good. <laughs> we're essential <laughs> services. So we have been vaccinated early. So we wanted to, to see how this, uh, you know, this development will be with ourselves. So we were 12 US executives in, together. And then we had people from Canada and Europe calling into that meeting. And, and sure enough, all the things you will expect that we have felt if you've been remote before the pandemic, if you're one of the few that are remote, it's really hard. But what we did, similar to what Lee's saying, we all, even if we were in the same room, we all had our devices in front of us. So we were on camera. The piece we couldn't figure out, and I'm sure someone, someone more tech savvy than us will figure out is the sound because you can't really mute and unmute when you talk. So we had like a, yeah, th that didn't work so well, but we are looking into some technology. There are these little, you've probably seen them like balls you can throw to the person speaking. So that the people on the other side will get some sound. You know, it's not ideal, it's not great, but people, the feedback from our colleagues were that just the difference between seeing one camera into the big room with the 12 people, having the same view that we're used to, to now through the pandemic with seeing people co close up on their individual camera on their device, even though they're in a room talking into like one speaker that we have in this, that, that was such a, 90% of the experience, uh, uh, we would say, compared to the, the old format of one camera and then people just satellite calling in. So that, that's, a, that's something we can, you can all try <laughs> when you get the opportunity, but we have to solve the, the sound piece because that was really hard because exactly what you said, Lee, when someone whispers something to someone close or someone laughing over there while someone is asking a question, we get disturbance on the sound. So that, that's a tech challenge, but I'm sure some will get all over that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. 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 Great. So I want to ask a couple more questions, then I want to open it up to everyone. So uh, it is Earth Day. So I figured this question may be somewhat fitting. Has your company made a commitment to reduce carbon? If so, has that played into your return to work plan? Right. So if you think about the amount of time people spend commuting and the impact on the environment, um, if they're not going to be commuting, there's some good news and there's been some interesting studies over the past year of the impact of this on the environment. So. Not on the commute specifically, Brian, uh, but yeah. we have talked about that as it relates to international travel and, and business travel in general. So, so where it makes sense, try to convert uh, to virtual meetings, uh, but, but still recognizing that we do need to see each other every now and then. Yeah. All right. Either one. I wish I had a better, uh, a stronger, this hasn't been a huge topic for this zone. I mean, we're, uh, I think lead gold buildings and so forth. So it's something that we're always mindful of with our office space, uh, but it hasn't been a, uh, a driver during the, the, some of this decision-making. Okay. Yeah, I would say that's the same for us, but we had a, a particular, we're headquartered in San Francisco. So the majority of our population actually didn't drive to work. They use public transportation anyway. Uh, that's a different issue, which is now people don't want to take transporta public transportation and they don't want to commute. So 
we're working through that. But we this isn't something that's been uh, a real driver for us also, just because we didn't have a lot of people that commuted by car to our general offices. They're in major cities, London, Paris, yeah. San Francisco, et cetera. Fair enough. Um, one more kind of, of these questions. So you know, all three of your companies um, you know, have won awards or been recognized as great places to work. Um, and I'm just wondering you know, how will your companies continue and other companies like you continue to drive employee engagement you know, in this new world of work? What's gonna, you know, what's gonna be important to making certain that employees um, are productive, that they like their environment and you're gonna onboard or you've already onboarded a lot of people that have never met their team mates in person and a lot of the fun and things that you guys are known for, it's a lot harder to do virtually. So what are some of the things that you're trying to do or thinking about doing going forward? I'm happy to start. <clears throat> I think for us, it's been uh, just, just a year of really understanding the value of strong internal communication. So we've been utilizing all the different channels that we have. And I think we, we found this new channel Teams for our for our part, the, the the effectiveness of running teams events and how engaging those can be, especially when you build in with some of the tools we have available, polls and and, and different things. And, and you can also allow a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily be visible to the organization to get some airtime on those virtual events. So I think that would be on our plan of things we're taking out of COVID that we really want to continue and, and, and emphasize in the future is all those virtual town halls that we call them in, in our company. And I think the other big thing for us is the power of purpose. And uh, I started with that, but, but just kind of building on, on that strong um, sense of being more important that we instilled in our people during this, but also building on that to, to further strengthening our community service. We have the, a, a strong partnership with Feeding America and Feeding Canada through this. Mm -hmm. And we can see how important that has been uh, for our for all of our associates, and, and so so we're gonna you know heavily build out some of those programs we have in that space. And then the third thing will be around diversity and inclusion. I'm, I'm sure everyone works with that too, but it's also something that has really been strengthened for us this year, and we see is a great source of engagement uh, through participation in different resource groups internally. So those will be three pillars uh, for our engagement plan going forward. That's great. Lee, anything from? Yeah, I, I, I would check plus to, to all three of those. I mean, again, I, I'll also just go full circle and say, you know, we found that the things that make our culture strong and, uh, you know, we traditionally get uh, pretty high engagement scores. We actually have our uh, survey out right now. It closes on Monday, our most recent. And, um, during the pandemic, we got our, our highest score yet, and it looks like this one's going to be even higher. And so it's just not forgetting who you are and um, what your values are. And then I think it took us a minute to realize that we shouldn't be trying to just replicate things that worked in the office virtually and, and instead sort of embrace like, hey, there's some pretty interesting things going on with the technology and we can try some brand new things. So um, it, it's not a, it's not a taking things from the office virtually. It's it's building a new virtual culture and and uh, yeah, just embracing those things um, and and having fun with it. We, we've done some some uh, really ridiculous things like we had poetry slam. Don't do that. That that went really really badly. Um, but you know things like virtual chocolate tasting. Uh, that that stuff works pretty good. Interesting. I work with one company where the CEO actually ordered a pair of slippers for every member of his team. I thought that was pretty cool. LL Bean slippers because they're like everybody's you know, dressed from the waist up. What's going on down below? And so <laughs> the slippers are a good idea. So, all right. Cool. So a couple of questions that have already come in. Um, one from James was, uh, can you chat a little bit about recruiting, hiring and acclimating um, new employees during this time? You know, and how you've gone about doing that or how you think that'll change going forward. Um, I can take that one, Brian, yeah. since we've done a lot of hiring during this time. Uh, you know, we actually found that the transition to all virtual interviews was really uh, easy. 
and that it actually allowed it to be easier for candidates to fit interviews in. And we put out sort of standards right away for what we expected from our interview teams in terms of how to create a virtual candidate experience around it. And, um, and then in terms of onboarding, we've really tried to make our day one experience like engaging and inspiring and as interactive as possible and the, to keep those cohorts uh, interacting over time because it's just very easy to get stuck talking to the same 15 to 20 people that you're in meetings with and you miss all the informal context and interaction that we used to have in the office. So we've had to try to create that. And then at a company level, we've really tried to drive employee engagement by doing like uh, frequent company events. So we have like a speaker series where we bring in outside speakers and we've done everything from like Databricks Got Talent to we did a big virtual auction where employees could auction off some you know, service they could provide based on their own talents and to raise money for COVID research. So we've done all kinds of things, but to try to get people involved. And, um, and I, similar to Ian, actually, we've also like really doubled down in terms of our diversity inclusion efforts. So we actually have over half of our employee population in one of our six ERGs now, employee resource groups. And we yes. do a lot in partnership with the ERGs to help plan these events so that DNI has sort of become really ingrained in our culture through the last year. And that helps sort of everyone feel a sense of belonging beyond just being in their immediate teams. Yeah. You know, what about hiring or, or Lee? Go ahead, Lee. I was just gonna, I was just yeah. gonna uh, double down on that, that, you know, for us opening up uh, a work from anywhere, uh, it really helps a lot with demographics as well. So for your DNI recruiting initiatives and so forth, um, there's a lot more options when you get out of your neighborhood, right? And so uh, being able to open things up, I think that's going to be a big win for the world as well. Um, having people be able to work from anywhere. And um, we've made a lot of the similar changes. And I can tell you that when we go back to opening our offices, we've already made the decision that all of our hiring processes will still remain virtual. Uh, we think that that's an important um, leveling of the playing field. Very cool. What about for you guys, Ina, whether in store or for pro professional staff? Yeah, for store, I mean, we're hiring a lot of people at the store depot and we actually cannot fill all the positions that we have at the moment. It's, it's unbelievable, but it's, you know, the, the, the lack of talent uh, for, for that level of work right now is, is really real. And um, we have done the same things. We've moved to virtual, full virtual, and um, if people want to opt in for that in the hiring process. Um, on the on the above store side, uh, I, I would just say that onboarding has probably been the number one challenge that we've been focusing on where we used to be, it was almost like coming to a family, you know, Brian, you met, met our people, we, we, we yeah. have a very particular personal onboarding and, 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 and that is that's something that has been impossible to, to, to manage through the pandemic. So, so that those are the people that we see struggle the most. And when we, when we segment the data that we have from our service, those are the people that the most want to come back to the office. Those are the people that have started during the pandemic. They really want to see and meet everyone in person. So, so that's definitely a challenge. But what we have seen is that with the combination of our decentralized structure that we talked about, other people have been involved in the onboarding that we wouldn't necessarily think about. And just to take a very example close to me, there are team members in my team that are based in, here in Charlotte, but they may report kind of two, three levels down in the organization where I've been involved in their onboarding because their next level manager is not here. So we've had this kind of one team approach to that, that whoever can support does support. So I've been visiting stores with new team members uh, from my own team and, and other teams and other managers have done the same. This is not because I'm in HR, so we've taken them to stores because we've been allowed to, we've been open. And if the stores are safe enough for our people and our customers, it's definitely safe enough for us to come visit every now and then too. So, so we've found some, some new ways of introducing very new relationships into the onboarding that we wouldn't traditionally do, that we have on the list of things we want to continue doing as we rethink our, our new practices post pandemic, because that's been, that, that's been really uh, successful. Yeah. Hey, you know, I want to stay there. So uh, I just got a question specific to you. Any thoughts on why it's difficult um, to get the non-exempt hourly employees? This person's company is also having difficulty with that. Um, I'm curious, like, you know, is it because of stimulus checks or unemployment, you know, benefits being so high that people would rather not work? 
then what's the... I think a little bit of all of the above because we see it across markets. It's not only a US problem, so it's not only the stimulus checks, but I do think, I mean, obviously that 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 is an important part of it, of course, uh, where there are, are incentives like that. But, but, but there's more, I think childcare has been, we, at our store level, we are 60% women, 60% of our store managers are women. Uh, it, it's really a, a gender uh, I would say, and, and uh, we can talk about that for a very, very, very long time about who has left the workforce and uh, during the pandemic, etc. But but for us, it, it seems to be that a lot of the people that we traditionally hired are out of the workforce for now, whether it's the stimulus checks or the need to be with their kids or whatever it is, they're, they're just not working. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Russell, you, you had a question that you wanted to ask, you want to unmute and yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. So I'm a commercial real estate. So full disclosure, I'm I'm very biased. <laughs> um, that said, what I keep hearing over and over again, and Lee, I'm particularly curious to hear your your take on this, is that that um, culture is degrading over time, and that you're you know you know you just talked about onboarding and and it's all well and good to talk about it now, but over time, like Lee, you mentioned one of your core values was caring about each other. If you don't actually know each other, can you really care? I mean, human nature is human nature. So I'm just curious what the plan is 12 months from now. Yeah, so for us, we, we will still have office space, so you can you can rest easy. Um, but it, I think the use of it will be different. And um, hey, we're, we're all projecting the future here a little bit, but I think I would argue that it's gonna be better. Um, we, we used to, we, done, we did some studies when um, some years ago when we were in the office about relationships. And what we found was if you're more than two like desks away from someone, or if you're definitely on a different floor from someone, the likelihood that you're interacting with them uh, was pretty low. And so we created some, um, uh, I think it's a Pixar thing, some intentional collision spaces, things like you know, uh, more kitchens, more hubs, instead of one place, uh, creating spaces where people would um, naturally bump into each other, as opposed to when you're sitting by your desk, at your desk, sort of working alone. And I think the, the our new office is going to be more of that, right? So we're all intentionally coming into work on or into the office on a certain day um, because there's some sort of event going on or there's a, a larger group meeting going on, that kind of thing. So I think what we won't be having in the office for the most part is heads down work, uh, which I, I don't, I'm not sure you're building relationships in that zone anyway. So um, I, I think our real estate footprint will actually be more intentional in that way, encouraging more, getting to know each other. And then the, the last thing I'd add is, again, back on the other side for the virtual world, um, you're going to have to be more intentional. I know I, as a boss, I'm, ha I'm, I'm uh, doing a better job of tracking who I've talked to and who I haven't and who I need to be um, pinging on a regular basis, right? So I have to be more thoughtful about it. So there's pros, you know, pros and cons. It takes a little more work to do that, but yeah, it's important. Hey, Lee, building on what you just said, and this is not my quote, but we have a quote in our, our presentation says, office will no longer be the place to do the work, but the place to meet and interact with the team. So, so there's someone else who said that, but I, we took that to heart because we felt it was so such a good capture of what we feel. So totally with you that we are going to, reorganize our office spaces too so that it accommodates for that collaboration social interactions and relationship that we want the office to foster that we do not think we can do virtually uh, and and we have a interesting project in our oslo office before the pandemic where they did exactly that reduced space half the down and they made small cafeteria like spaces they're also kind of extreme quiet places we call it the library you're not allowed to have your phone in there so it's supposed to be completely quiet, but it's just kind of designated spaces that are so different and accommodates for different needs you can have during your workday. But 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 the, the, the thought that we're not necessarily coming here to execute the work that's mine. I'm coming here for the team and for for the, the you know that that whole sharing 
and, and being together. That's just a new way of thinking. And it totally kind of changes the way you think about what that office should look like and what, what facilities you need. Great. Amy? I mean, I agree. I think, Russell, you can rest assured that offices are not going away completely. <laughs> and even for, you know, there's a, there's a number of tech companies that have been all virtual uh, from the start, and even they do have these office hubs. So I think that certainly we're in the same camp that we're going to use the office space very intentionally. We want it to be to bring people together to create an experience that is different than what this feels like to do this all virtually. And uh, so we may not expand our footprint, you know, exponentially, but we certainly plan to use the space that we have and use it uh, in a way that really does bring people together to connect. I want to ask one other polling question out of curiosity for um, for the group. So let's see, how do I do this? Um, relaunch polling. No, not that one. <laughs> one second. So if given the choice, the people on this call, would you prefer to fully return for a hybrid or to permanently work from home? All right, let me share what we got. So 85% in favor of hybrid, 11% permanently work from home and um, one person wants to return to the office, fully return. That's pretty close to our surveys, I would say, yeah. internally. Say and same. Yeah, we've had only 7% wanna uh, go back full time to the office. 93% of our employees wanna or either work from home part-time or full-time yeah. with most of them indicating part-time. So on, on that note though, are you thinking that, you know, I mean, yeah, to scare Russell, but you, you need less office space because everybody isn't going to be in every day. Do you designate certain days of the week for certain teams to come in or what's the, what, what, what's the best way to, you know, have you given some thought to that? Is HR Monday and Finance Tuesday and Marketing Wednesday and you know, nobody has an assigned space or is it some people come back? What are some of the thoughts that you guys are doing? I, I love that that you asked what's the best way to do it because I think we'll learn a lot over yeah. the rest of this year. I don't know that anybody really knows. Uh, what we're thinking about is we're not assigning desks anymore. So everything will be hotel drop-in and we will assign uh, teams days to come in. Okay. We're doing the same. I have a business opportunity for Russell. We're <laughs> hoping that that someone is going to start, uh, you know, the swing office space, kind of the WeWork style, but in this collaboration world, like I want to, I want a Starbucks that I can rip for the day in, you know, a lot of major cities in America that I can send a team into. We, we've been, we're calling it local social where people in around zip codes can get together and maybe just be in the same space for the day. And we're, we're struggling initially to find um, businesses or companies that are really set up to do that. So if he can start that for me and just let me know in a few months when he has it going. Uh, yeah, we'll no your problem. First I just uh, need some uh, information on some uh, angel investors. Uh, <laughs> hundred million should do it. Uh, I'm not- uh, Brian's your guy. Work. Yeah. I don't need 600 billion. So, my my, my yeah. understanding is that I actually just read that there's a handful of breweries that are actually looking at using their space during daytime hours um, for that, right? And I think a lot of these um, more localized, I'm on the board of Advent co-working, co-working space here. And I keep saying this space is exactly what the future of an office should look like. It's more meeting space and open dance floor than offices. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Ina, thought? No, we haven't figured that out at all. Um, so we have one hour, had one hour, I will say, before we added Hong Kong that is within working hours where the global teams can meet. And that's 10 to 11 Eastern because we still have Riga and Russia from 5 to 6 and we have 7 to 8 a.m. on the Western time. So, so, so we already kind of really struggle to find time for people to meet. And then we have the whole traveling to see stores uh, 
primarily Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So, so that's a really hard one because I think if we go go to the hybrid, we will go to the hybrid. But like, how are people? If if the point of coming back to the office is to see each other, how do we know that we meet someone there <laughs> when yeah. people are so much out and about? So that that's that's really the one that keeps keeps up uh, up at night on this topic. How do we get those schedules together so that when you come to the office, it's not an empty office, but it is actually the people you want to meet and interact with. Great. So with that, I just wanted to thank the three of you for your time and everyone else for your um, attendance today. We will actually, this is going to be available as a replay. So if there's others in your organization that you think would benefit from hearing this, um, I'll be making this available. Um, really interesting insights. Um, as we heard, nobody has mm -hmm. the answer because there probably isn't the answer. There are lots of different answers and it's going to be company specific. And there will be a competitive advantage that emerges mm -hmm. in terms of how certain companies play this you know, better than others. Um, and the employees, um, they can vote with their feet in terms of where they choose to work. And I think that's what's going to be so interesting going forward is you know, how much um, employee engagement. I, I don't like looking at retention as the goal. The goal is engagement. If people are enjoying what they're doing, they'll stay for the right reasons. And you know, retention, overpay people and ask very little of them and they'll stay, but for all the wrong reasons. And so um, you know, I think the three of you are all forward looking in the way that you're addressing this for your company is about employee engagement and productivity. And so I applaud you for that. And I appreciate everyone's time. And uh, yeah, I want to end on time. So thanks for everyone's attendance and enjoy the rest of your Earth Day. Go do something good for the environment today. Thanks Thank so you, Brian. Much for having Thank us. you, Pam. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Take bye -bye. care now. Bye.